<laughs> Aloha, and welcome back to season three of the Aravinda Show. This season is focused on manifesting and creating what we want to create. It's about energy flowing where your attention is going. And for today's episode, I get to sit down with musician, adventurer, author, and speaker, Jamie Caddo, a man whose work has inspired me for years. Let's go. Aloha. Welcome back to our Vinda show. I'm really, really excited to have Jamie Caddo today. I'm your host, Andrew Crusoe, and Jamie Caddo is a founding member of Faithless. He left in 1999, and he went to go on to form the two-time Grammy-nominated global music film collective One Giant Leap with him and Duncan Bridgman. They toured over 50 countries, including India, Australia, Europe. is not a country, but Senegal, all these places. And they have this vision to explore unity through diversity. With over 300,000 albums sold, They've just really made an impact here. And then in 2008, they did it again with their second album, What About Me, which I really, really love. And then several years later, Jamie's come out with a quite hilarious and insightful book, I feel, called Insanely Gifted. And it offers techniques and uh, really exercises and insights to transform our thinking and how to turn our inner demons into allies and how to be playful and totally accept all parts of ourselves. Jamie also leads workshops to this end, and it, they're just remarkable. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Wicked. That's wonderful to be here. Thanks. <laughs> it's, I was really surprised. Um, I, uh, it, For people who are familiar with One Giant Leap, I really loved how you were able to weave... Um, you know, that sort of philosophy into this book, but it's also a different take. It, I, f I feel the lessons that you've learned through your music career coming through here in an interesting way. And yeah, there, there's so much to, there's so much I could talk about. I, I don't even know where to start. Uh, why don't you start by saying uh, where you are and what you're up to today? You, you're, you're on an adventure. I am on an adventure, yeah. I'm going five <laughs> weeks across America at the moment because I finished a movie called Becoming Nobody, which is a, it's like a celebration of the message of the first self-help teacher and sacred clown, Ram Dass. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's not a biography. It's like a film of the best of his message all woven together with me chatting to him. Of this, like, just like one giant leap, a transmission into people's hearts, not a, not a head trip of information biographically. And luckily the film is, by all accounts, not wanting to jinx it, the film is doing pretty well. just opened in four new L.A. cinemas and across America. Um, it's kind of in, people are interested enough for me to come from England and do a five-week tour across. So I'm, wow. I'm, I'm going day by day to different kind of roadside motels with vibrating beds <laughs> and uh, the kind of places where you stay, kind of places where you stay when you've robbed a bank. Oh, oh that's wonderful. Uh, is, is a vibrating bed extra? Uh, you have to put coins in, yeah, quarters. Oh, okay. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I won't do it now because it'll get into the audio of this thing. Oh, I, don't wanna... I, I thank you very much for that. I just I, I stopped it just before we started this. Well, they usually have like a red, like a cancel, right? Like with the spaceships and stuff. Stop, yeah, stop, stop. exactly, exactly. So you're on this adventure. There's so many places we could go with this because you've had such an interesting career. And I think, I think what you've been able to do with your career is a great example of how you can, you can completely, your, your career is a reflection of your own personal growth journey. You know, in, in that way, it sort of reminds me of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Steve Pavlina. Uh, he, you know, no. he's, a, he's a personal growth um, author and blogger, and his career has sort of done a similar thing. He's, he's, as he's grown, it's very much shifted, and he's not afraid to show these parts of himself that people would want to edit out. You know, and that's a huge theme of, of your work, right? I mean, yeah, I mean the, the walking permission slips, right? That's right. The genesis of the whole thing really comes from a, a need to connect, wanting to open up the aperture of in intimacy between everybody. 
And so that includes shadow work because when you show the messier stuff and the vulnerable stuff and the stuff which isn't in your glitzy shop window, mm -hmm. it actually creates more intimacy with people. Even though people hide from it, they think they're going to get rejected. It's actually the very thing that creates more closeness and connection. And also just wanting to celebrate the unity and all the diversity. For me, I've always just met people as if I already know them kind of thing. Mm. Um, like I, as a child even, you know, just expected, you know, well, here we all are, you know, and it, it kind of, for most children, I think it, it shuts you down that actually you get forced into more and more separateness of who's tall, who's short, who's a winner, who's a loser, who's rich, who's poor, who's a good boy, who's a bad girl. And, <laughs> and you, you start you start having to differentiate so much that it creates this huge isolation and people show less and less of themselves. So to make mm. all these films and music and also the Ramdas film, Becoming Nobody, is, is pretty much the same message, which is stop trying to edit yourself down, allow yourself to be more unmasked, more show, more of yourself and be less, less uptight around this perfectionist idea of being whatever your notion of being good is. Hmm. Do you feel that, so, so the film is calling Becoming Nobody, and I can't wait to see it. Do you feel that it's sort of a spiritual successor to Insanely Gifted, in a way? I think all of the things are. Yeah. All, all of, everything is the same vein, just finding more and more and more ways to make that good medicine be a transmission into people's hearts and feelings. So it's not like... It's not like a film or an album that gives people certain thoughts, although I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure it puts thoughts in people's heads. <laughs> it's more something to sort of bypass the thinking mind and take people on such a loving, kind, awake journey into themselves while they're experiencing the music or the movie that at the end of it, the beautiful, kind, true version of themselves is very much awake. And they really like almost kind of come out of a trance of the ego melodrama just for that bit of time. So it's almost like medicine, like good medicine coming out the screen or the speakers is always my aim. And then when you've finished mm. an album or a film, it's forever. That's the other wonderful thing about it. It's not like a play in the theatre where it's finished, everyone who saw it saw it, but that's done. When it's an album or a film, people can come back to it like a never-ending meal, a never-ending source of inspiration and good medicine forever after that. And that's why I really love that fact. Hmm. I'm curious about um, how your childhood, if we, if we can touch on your childhood, I'm curious how your childhood, you know, influenced you in, it could, I mean how, how young were you when you realized you were an artist that you you wanted to be creative in your adult life I was always as even the tiniest little boy you know mm -hmm. in inverted commas the artist in the family of a quite <laughs> conservative family oh, and yeah. it was very much held and supported you know like I was given all the felt tip pens and paper that okay. any child could have um, and taken to clay modeling classes on Saturday mornings and you know it was very very much supported and um, even when I was a teenager and I was uh, starting to be in bands, um, immediately my mum, you know, gave over the basement of her house. <laughs> God bless her, had to hear the, the, the terrible crashings and bangings of me and my teenage friends and paid for the first run of T-shirts of our band so that we could sell them at the gigs. And so I've been massively, massively oh, held wow. and supported of being, being an artist right from the beginning. That's brilliant. Uh, can, I, can I ask, um, what was your first band called? My first band was called the Big Truth Band, and it was oh. like us in purple flares and waistcoats trying to sound like the Hot House Flowers from Ireland <laughs> with big gospel backings and big sacred songs about the light and about how we were all, you know, one. And <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, it's, it was so funny reading this book, Insanely Gifted, which I recommend everybody check out. It's, it's, it's about 220 pages, but it's pretty dense um, in terms of there's so much... There's a lot of replay value in this book, if that makes any sense. And, and I was really struck by um, how, your, how your sensitivity and compassion comes across in this. I mean, the oneness thing, you know, I mean, even, even the philosophies behind One Giant Leap, seeing the diversity in our unity and the unity in our diversity, it's, it, it's amazing how it's all connected. You know, you really, does it, is that does that take a lot of work or is that just something where you you don't really have a desire to do anything else i'm curious yeah. where that is definitely whatever i'm doing i want it to be is creating as many ripples of what i would call positivity but don't you know that's just the model i'm living in yeah i'm not expecting everyone else to have to follow my model but my best take from the things i've seen and heard and experienced with my level of intelligence mm -hmm. has i have the model that i follow includes creating as many good ripples of things that will help people inspire people make people feel relief especially lighten people up 
that's mm-hmm. the biggest one of like you know letting people really like relax into the imperfection into the chaos into the being a sacred fool you know like tripping over your heartstrings spilling the wine bringing much more <laughs> of that that mischief and that freedom and that flow back into life which is usually in the yin more receptive part mm. of ourself that can be a let go and be a passenger rather than the yang part that has to generate something has to control something has to keep myself safe boom 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 like we were taught in school we mm-hmm. were given this massive yang imbalance in school mm-hmm. it was so linear to get to the end and get to the next thing and and the yin where you just stop and listen and feel and intuitively just know stuff is kind of poo-pooed and looked at as some sort of fantasy or mm-hmm. silly but that's actually now my true compass of my life is stopping listening and feeling and i wouldn't do a yang generating action to go and exert my will to create a project if i hadn't started in the yin and the listening part of me that receptively heard the idea and thought oh, yeah that is good let's do that yeah yeah and you you yeah, and I love the way you describe that exact process in the book. You're talking about how it's got to start from this space of, of almost emptiness, um, which sort of connects to um, the little a little bit in one of the One Giant Leap songs. I, I wish I knew, I don't recognize everyone's voices. and I, If people aren't familiar with the band, you have these wonderful interludes in both albums and, and samples of these very wise people speaking from all over the world. And there's one where the guy's talking about, maybe, I don't know if you remember, he's saying, he's talking about cultivating emptiness, awareness, and clarity. And he says, may it be so. Yeah, that's Ram Dass. That is Ram Dass, <laughs> isn't it? Okay. I, like that's I said, Ram Dass, <laughs> yeah. In the first movie, you know, the first movie each had a different chapter. And in the death chapter, Ram Dass just lists all the symptoms of aging. Um, that's what he's doing. In that bit, he goes, loneliness. Uh, oh. loss of psychological you know he, he just lists all the symptoms of aging and then he goes try to stay with the changes yeah at uh, the same moment one all time cultivate equanimity yeah <laughs> Oh man, Jamie, you have I love no that it's Ram Dass, the one you chose. That's genius. Oh man, I'm I'm doing my best, going with the flow. I I Jamie, <laughs> I cannot tell you. And you said you're working on humility, so I'm not going to try to do this too much. I cannot tell. you. I was being you, sarcastic. I was being sarcastic. I know. I was being sarcastic. I was I was double level double level sarcasm. Um, <laughs> I cannot yeah. tell you how many times I've listened to that song, and 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 it's I can't believe I didn't realize that was Ram Dass. Um, I love, and it's, it's great. It's this funny little, um, it's this wonderful little break in, in the music. And I think about that so much. There's so many of those interludes that get stuck in my head, actually, almost as much as the melodies do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those were interviews we did as we traveled the 50 countries. They weren't samples. Yes. Yes. And we should talk about that too. And I, yeah, I have seen, this is why I'm kind of bumping my head here is, um, (laughs) pun intended, uh, is I've seen both films, so I can't believe I didn't remember that. I, I love I love those films. I, I, mm. I, 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 just seeing the faces, you know, because I listened to the albums many, many times before I saw the films. Maybe seeing The great bit. thing about the music in the films, I'll tell you, is that Duncan has a massive OCD thing <laughs> that when you're seeing one of the instruments being played, and there's mm. like 150 different musicians, mm-hmm. or you're hearing one of them sing, you're, whatever you're seeing on the screen is the actual take that you're listening to. So <laughs> even though we may have done 40 takes with some one-string Chinese Eru player, oh he will find the exact take that he used in the audio and then go through the footage to make sure that the visual one was take 23 um, and get the only that. So every single instrument you see being played in that movie and every single song you're being sung is the take you're listening to. It's live, being played live, not some kind of nice-looking picture of an instrument on top you know and duncan had like a massive thing about that that is harrowing <laughs> i know it took so long very impressive um has duncan written a book yet because he, he should write a book about how to manage that kind of project holy crap i'd read he that. should yeah holy no, but he made a really great film called hetero in mexico uh which was after one giant leap in the style of one giant leap he did the sort of like oh, unity yeah. diversity just of mexico and it was a huge movie over there as well if you like mexican culture you should check it out Oh yes yes I should put all three of the films in the show notes for this episode so people can check Sweet, them out. Yeah. I know, I believe it's his Vimeo that has um, both of the One Giant Leap films mm-hmm. as well as a bunch of clips. That's right. Which I really He's the only ones that can be counted on to put the correct cut because there are other cuts of our films wandering around where people, uh, have glued bit, people have glued bits of the film together and their own little kind of cut. <laughs> well, everything is a mashup these days, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also a great series on YouTube. Um I, I can't believe that he, uh, that must have just been a remarkable uh, 
feat of, of collecting so much. I mean, I feel like we were kind of in the middle of the story, and I, I want to give some context. For people who aren't familiar with One Giant Leap, how did One Giant Leap start, for people who may not be familiar with it? When I first met Duncan, um, our, you know, we had an explosion of talk about music, and three things that came out of it were, were one, that two of our favorite albums were quite obscure albums were absolutely the same one was my life in the bush of ghosts by david byrne and brian eno which was the album they made after remain in light oh. um and then it was like the first use of samples ever it's like 1981 or something and they use all ancient crazy preachers from kentucky radio and <laughs> it's an amazing record and the other one was peter gabriel's music for the last temptation of christ movie which is called passion so oh. those two albums were massive for both of us which you quote in your mo your book too you mentioned yeah passion so when we, when we were talking about you know all the amazing world music multicultural artists that were on those records, we started getting into another bugbear we both had a bee in our bonnet, which was that in those times, in the nineties when we were having this conversation, it was like, how come there are these incredible singers like Baba Mal and flute players like Harry Prasad Chirazia and Shrinvas mm -hmm. and Asher Bosley and these incredible musicians all over the place, and all of their albums don't sound good. There's not one world music album that's been well produced, well mixed, where you can really hmm. get how great, and you can never listen to a whole one. So we thought, wow, we should get together and make some music where we really showcase how incredible these musicians are in a big and oh, landscapey Pink Floyd type music oh, with a bit yeah. of hip hop thrown in and something that's so <laughs> listenable and rich that, and that you can really hear how amazing they are. And chuck in a favorite, few of our favorite artists that we love from the West, like Michael Stipe or Maxi from Faithless. Yeah. Um, oh, Maxi is just remarkable. Mm. Yeah. Can I ask um, what year that was when you guys came to this realization that none of the world music albums had been mastered very well or even maybe even recorded? I guess it must have been, I guess it must have been like 96, 97. Okay. So comparatively speaking, not that long ago. No, 23, I mean, 24 years. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you have it's this idea. Well, yeah, yeah. But so you have this idea and what do you do next? I mean, obviously it's going to cost you know, to do this. No, so we, first thing we did was we, because no one was going to hear it except us, we were just doing it because we were, as a musical project, you know, we were just doing it because we wanted it for ourselves. Oh. So, so we went and sampled, took, took samples of all the artists we wanted, chucked them all in the computer. We found a Linton Kwesi Johnson album, The Poet, incredibly that even though he does his stuff with reggae music on the b side of it it was all just the voice it was all a cappella, so it's like oh hallelujah and uh, so we chopped all these things together and chris blackwell who started island records and chris blackwell signed like bob marley and u2 he's like a big mogul okay, from that, jamaica that's why he sounds familiar and he he heard it and said this is the best sounding world music fusion i've ever heard we have to have this album and they signed us on the spot and oh. asked, um, but they said, we're not a, a record company anymore. We're a film company. We're called Palm Pictures. We're all about this new thing called DVD. And so you have to make a DVD now to go with your album. So yeah. we went, oh, okay, well, we don't think filming up. We, we said, we don't want to use any of these samples. We want to go to the countries and do original recordings, collaborating with all these artists. Oh, they so said, you hadn't traveled at all at that point yet? No, 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 not at oh, all. Okay. And they said, great, film it for the DVD. And we said, yeah, but just us going around plugging in instruments, that's not a very interesting film. How about if we included all the people that had inspired us and really made us think like, um, you know, mm. Kurt Vonnegut and Dennis Hopper and Ramdas and all these different people. Yeah. And we also gave each one of the songs a theme. One could be God, one could be sex, one could be death, one could be money. Universal themes that if you talk to people in a mud hut in Africa or, a, or you know, a penthouse in L.A., everyone could talk about it. Mm -hmm. Then we'll cut together all the different things people say and you'll have like a film album of all these short films, um, mm. one for each philosophical theme celebrating the unity and the diversity of all the different people playing and talking. They went, great. And then we said, well, how, what's the budget? And they said, we don't know. We've never done this before. Call us when you need more money. And how that's did you how they feel operate. about that? Were you, were you like, oh, man, are we going to... I mean, I, obviously you were exciting. trying to keep it as inexpensive as possible, but you just sort of... Yeah, it was super inexpensive. There was only four of us traveling. Okay, wow. That's a very small crew. Yeah, it was, it was really fun. Where did you go first? Senegal, because Chris Blackwell and Palm and Island, they have Baba Mal on their label. They also manage him. Oh. And he's the greatest, you know, one of the greatest Senegalese singers. He's from the Fulani tribe, who are the messengers who go around not just singing, but bringing the news and calming families down who are having problems. It's this beautiful tribe in Senegal. So that's where they took us first. And we got to oh. Dakar. 
And then they drove us out of Dakar out into God knows where for 12 hours. It was like 48 degrees. And we get to this place and there he is. And we said that Duncan, Duncan had wired this little mini recording studio so we could, we could be in the jungle, on the, you know, we could, on the mountain. We could be anywhere recording for 12 hours. And uh, we just went from there all the way down through Africa, through Senegal, through Ghana, through Mali, through oh. Uganda, through South Africa. Then we flew across to India, went all over there, and then through Nepal, then through Thailand, a couple of other places, over to Australia, through Australia to New Zealand, worked with incredibly Maori, tribal, Polynesian oh. artists. Um, it just went on and on and on. And then we, we came back and cut it all into a TV series, a movie, and the album. How long did you travel? For the six months. Six months. Yeah. No days off. No days off. No. What was the what was the most challenging part about that? And and I can guess what the most rewarding part of that was. I think the challenging part of it is that you miss so much of it because you're so busy producing and directing and composing and line producing. Because we just line you know, I did the line producing as in the booking of the cars and the planes and the, the logistics. Because oh, wow. so you're doing all that, you can miss a lot of the now. You can miss yeah, a lot yeah. of the the incredibleness of being in all these places because you're so, so busy taking care of everything. I, I've definitely experienced that. It's You can miss the forest for the trees sometimes. A little bit. A little bit. But that was also great in the in the editing afterwards because you'd, you'd forgotten so many things and then when these, gem, <laughs> these gems start coming together and you go, God, that was amazing that day. I hadn't remembered how great that was. You know, like suddenly you get the treasure at the end when you're doing your library logging before the edit. Yeah. So if I understand correctly... So Duncan sort of being logistics mastermind for the for the film, the cut sounds like, and you're sort of making sure that you know <laughs> the cars and the transportation logistics make sense. Was that well, sort that's of just the, the line production part? But that's then there's the directing of the movie and the producing of the movie. Oh, and the direct and the composing of the music. Oh, I, can't I was even just imagine. saying, doing all of those at the same time, oh, it's easier to miss. Oh my God, Jamie, how did you? How many hours did you sleep? <laughs> Well, we just, it, it, we were so running on what fun we were having because it was, yeah. the second one, Giant Leap, was an absolute nightmare to do. I want to get to well, that too. <laughs> but the first one was a gift, was literally everything just dropped in our lap. Everywhere we went, like Asher Bosley, who's the greatest Bollywood singer, you know, in, in India. So, you know, one of the greats. You know, we had, we just walked out of a hotel and there she was standing there, you know, about to get into her car. And that's how you just met her. Yes, right? yeah, so she wasn't even a phone call through a man, just walked up to her and said, Hey, open the laptop. And she said, Actually, I've got 20 minutes. Set up a chair over there on that lawn. So we just Get did covered it, in, covered it in flowers. She did the take for Love the Way You Dream and left. The whole thing was like, Get out. Well, you know, less than an, <laughs> less than an hour, the whole thing of meeting her and her leaving. Oh my God. That was totally spontaneous then. It yeah. Like. Oh my God. And there were so many. That's what One Giant Leap was like. And also, you know, the guys in Ghana who were twisting in ecstasies in bushes, there's this scene where these people are doing a pagan, pre Christian yeah. ceremony. They're spinning and jumping and their eyes are white and their heads are shaking and they're covered in clay. Yes. You know, that was another, that wasn't planned. That was the, the sister of, of our driver that day was having, he said, my, I see you filming these cultural things. My sister down the road is they're doing a thing. If you go and buy a goat and a bottle of brandy, they might <laughs> let you film that. So that's what we did. And, and, uh, and then they let us film this unbelievable ceremony, which is cut in with all the, the evangelical Christian preachers. We do this cut with the preachers and the pagans yeah. together. Oh, man. It's quite a powerful bit with Baba Mal singing, in fact. Very transgressive and delightful to watch. Actually. Yeah. Because <laughs> well, for me, it's all one thing. So I'm going to mm -hmm. keep expressing through the films and the music. It's all one thing. Different religions, different whatever. It's one face. It's many faces for one energy. In fact, the first idea of the unity diversity for One Giant Leap was, wouldn't it be great to have a rabbi followed by an imam? followed by a Christian priest, followed by a Buddhist, and talk to them all about the same subjects. And they would all say pretty much the same thing because, of course, the essential teachings of all those religions are the same. Mm. And, and, um, and it would show once and for all, for anyone that hadn't worked it out yet, that it's one great spirit coming through many doorways. Yeah. The infinite or source or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Wow. So I don't need to fight about it. It's just different flavors. You don't fight about whether you're having Italian food or French food or Thai noodles or, mm. you know what I mean? It's just you assume it's all food. Yeah. Well, if you're a rational person, you don't fight about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, before, I want to talk about the second album, which is a very challenging experience for you guys. But before I do, I'm curious your feelings about religion now. You know, I, I grew up rather religious and I became less religious and uh, going, getting older and basically not attaching my identity to my beliefs as much. 
because I realized that beliefs are more like software and running on a computer. You can change your software. You can update your beliefs to be more accurate. Yeah. But where you are now, I mean, uh, my, my challenge with religion is I feel like it creates an in-group and an out-group. And yeah. that's, that's the real challenge for it. So I guess I'm curious what your... Uh, what your feelings are on it now, like what place, especially these days where, you know, uh, the church has less power than it used to. And it, things have kind of, at least in, at least in the West, I feel that people have become, you know, a little more secular. On average. Yeah. They've still got far <laughs> too much. They've got far, far, far too much real estate though. The yeah. church's assets should start being liquidated now for, and being given to the kind of causes that Christ clearly represents. There's mm-hmm. no way that the church should be able to hold on to that kind of money. Uh, when they represent Jesus and they represent his values, there's no question in anybody's mind what Christ's values are, mm-hmm. which is take off your fucking wealth and give all your stuff to the poor and really help those with your heart that are just like you. Don't judge a rich person over a poor person. Give what you can. Be humble. Okay, that's unquestionably what the Christ transmission is about. Yeah. They've got all the money that they've got off people's deathbeds um, in representing, you know, in his name. So that yeah. money should clearly be liquidated and, and, and serving the people yeah. who most need it. Given to people who don't have clean water. What's not obvious about that, you know, yeah. what's not obvious about that? That's the tricky part with religion, right? That you get, you have a system that's disseminating information, and then when power gets concentrated, it appeals to people's uh, darker nature sometimes, and they yeah they fall prey to it. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. It, it, the message was love one another. So how did you get to, you know, several years passed, and uh, obviously that was a huge effort. To create, I think, how long did it take you to, to create the first Wine Giant Leap album? I think it was uh, over two years, something like that? Yeah, about two and a half. I would say six months pre, pre-production, six months production, and then a year and a half post-production to cut and mix a movie, a series, and an album. And it did pretty well. I mean, I think you guys got uh, a lot of attention, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you look at... I've never, I don't know, when you look at One Giant Leap, you know, in those days, and maybe today as well, but in, certainly in those days... The two, you know, career suicide things you could do mm. were world music and spirituality. <laughs> Both world music and spirituality about the naffest, most uncool, most, <laughs> you know. Really? And world music? I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, it was professional suicide. Huh. But I'm not a musician, so it's, I'm learning. I'm learning all the way. It's changed now, though. It's changed. And do you think, I, I, would, I would feel that you and Duncan have done a lot to, to change that, just... Based on I don't know. Example. We didn't do it on purpose. We we, we did what we did <laughs> fully, fully selfishly. We didn't do it for the world. Yeah. Well, sometimes when you want to make something because you love it and you don't think about the whole world, often the whole world benefits. I trust my selfishness. Hmm. I think Anthony DeMello, the beautiful monk who wrote Awareness, he's not up with us anymore. Is it? Um, hmm. He says, you know, it's just, just have great taste in your selfishness. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So there was a bit of a br- I don't I don't know if it was I don't know if it felt like a break to you, but there was sort of a break between the albums. How did the second one come about? I guess um, when Annie Lennox saw the first one, Giant Leap, she invited me to direct the videos for her new album because I used to direct the videos for Faithless, which is why Palm Pictures trusted us a little bit. Uh, and um, so she was managed by this guy called Simon Fuller, who I didn't know, but who I didn't know this. But he had a 19 Entertainment. They did the Spice Girls, yeah. Pop Idol, X Factor, American Idol. You know, he did all that. He was like a billionaire mogul. Oh, he did American I, Idol too. Yeah, I didn't know that about him. I just thought he was her manager. So I just sort of swanned in. Uh-huh. And it was actually a meeting for him to tell me they weren't going to do the videos after all. So it was a bit of a bummer. Mm-hmm. But um, at the end of the meeting, he asked me about One Giant Leap. And um, we got into a conversation. It wasn't a pitching conversation, but it ended up with him funding the next one with a budget about 50 times the size. Yeah, I, I recall in the book, <laughs> you were sort of stunned that this person who... He was so mainstream. He's mainstream main, pop main... culture. <laughs> yeah. No, was, he, he's, you know, he's a, he's a wild card, Simon Fuller. You know, he does a lot of really extraordinary... Um, you know, it's, it's one of the sort of worst kept secrets in the world that he's been the biggest donator to Greenpeace 10 years running ever. Wow. You know, he, like, he gets involved in a lot of shit. So, yeah, they, they just went for it and, and uh, were totally behind 
the philosophy behind it you know he he, he the reason he's interested in it as well is because he's also interested in sport in the way that you know what are the things that mm. bring people together and mm. sport is another one that, oh, that yeah. you know we can be standing next to a total stranger in a bar you know we wouldn't even have eye contact with them but then some millionaire kicks a a, a leather thing into the to the back of a net and suddenly you're jumping up and down hugging this total stranger what a weird placebo that you just saw some little weird bit of sports on a screen and it makes mm. you suddenly super close to the person next to you. It's about an intimacy permission slip. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that, that when, you know, when your team or your country or your state is playing, it does kind of unify everybody in a, in a kind of a way. And uh, music does that too. So he's very interested in all kinds of projects which unify people. Good for him. I'm so glad. Yeah. I mean, do you think that there would have been you know hypothetical question but do you think there would have been a second one giant leap or it would have just been a very different form if he yeah, had we would i don't know we would we would have kind of got busy on it um eventually maybe yeah. it's, it's just one of those things like i've never once got the budget for any of my projects from the meeting <laughs> from the meeting i was supposed to be in not right. once in my whole career it's right. always been you walked into this room this happened someone suggested that and then you were doing it it's like you just keep following your excitement wow. and what turns you on artistically and just really just hope that you don't even really hope you just keep doing it because it's enjoyable to do it even when you haven't got the big budget if you're not enjoying doing it for the small budget right i doubt you'll get the big big budget right that's all, all the projects we've got the money for they were all side projects one giant leap was a side project from faithless faithless right. was a side project from all of our solo albums we right. were doing our solo albums for rollo on cheeky records we were all signed as solo artists and he said wouldn't it be great to do an album that mixed different styles you know because in those days you had house music over here hip-hop over there you never mix things on an album no, no. only one style that so he be. said i like ballads i like house i like so i'm gonna do an album with all of them he got all his solo artists maxi from cheeky records me the ballad singer sister bliss the house dj he said <laughs> we're gonna do an album all together but there was a side project and of course it went massive because it was passionate side projects are passionate because you're doing them not because of the money you're doing them because you just dig it and it's right, always right. been with me the side projects which then get the budget because they just have an infectious authenticity and, and the momentum behind them so that's how faithless began yeah it's a side project oh, i didn't know that huh that's amazing so you get the funding for one giant leap two and i believe the title changed a couple times in the middle yeah of it. the first thing we were doing was <laughs> we because it was our second film we tried all these different we thought of these different ideas and the one we hit upon was that the theme of the second film was going to be duality mm -hmm. and how there's no absolute truth because every every dark thing has the light aspect and every light thing has a dark aspect and you can't have pleasure without pain and blah 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 so that was what we set off around the world to make that film and we realized after a few months that we weren't getting anything very good because everyone was just saying word for word what I just said to you, you can't have pleasure without pain. It just became a one-trick pony of everybody uh, saying the uh, same thing, lots of different ways. And we were all yeah. looking at each other and going, oh, shit, I'm not sure, we, <laughs> I'm not sure this is turning into uh, anything very good. Uh, and then luckily, I had a massive family crisis. So there wasn't enough variation in the... Yeah, it just became the... one concept that didn't spread out sideways very well. Wow. It looked like it was going to be good when we first thought of it, but right. actually in the practice of making it, it didn't really yield very much other than the same thing. So, But then luckily I had a massive crisis in my private life, in my mm -hmm. family life, mm -hmm. and everything fell apart. And mm -hmm. um, suddenly when I was doing the interviews, it was like screw the script of getting these questions and meeting Eckhart Toller or whoever else. It was like, I need to know the answers to some serious questions. You were on a personal <laughs> quest now. Yeah, and as much as you're yeah. feeling comfortable to talk about Jamie, um, you, uh, your, your marriage kind of, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> had a tough it all time. went awry. <laughs> yeah. It all went a bit awry. So I was in a, like quite a panic and all my, um, codependency and their di mm -hmm. relationship addiction mm -hmm. and terror and humiliation and blah, blah, blah was going mad. And can I just give you, I just want to let, I, I was so refreshed at how brutally honest you are and insanely gifted sort of about that and about your Dude, like you're very, <laughs> you're but very... I just want everyone to talk. You know, it's not, it's not that. I mean, it's, it's, it's banal in you're a way. You're so Everyone's vulnerable had their in this book, though. It was inspiring. Yeah, well, I, I just think for me that's normal. I want to normalize that. I don't mean vulnerable as in being soppy and weepy. No. Vulnerable as in just saying really straight what happened, and then everyone else goes, "Oh, I can say really straight what happened to me," even though I was a bit ashamed of that right. or I was a bit vulnerable. And then we have the proper intimacy and connection we want. Right. It's not. It's not because I. It's, it's nothing holy about it. It's I want the deeper connection with everyone, not just the version where they're telling me they're fine and all the things that went well. Right, right. So you're, yeah, you're being the change that you want to see. 
Yeah. You're showing people but that first. It feels so. normal. As I said, yeah. I don't think it's wacky. I think this is normal and everyone else is wacky. I I want to live on your planet. I think I think your planet is colonizing this planet more and more Good. with things like this. Because I <laughs> I don't think it's wacky. I think it's inspirational. I think it's like, yeah, I want more of that. I want to see more of that. I because that's where we that's how you build intimacy is through vulnerability. You know, and, and not it's one and of the one of the ways. And laughter as yeah. well, which is a huge oh, part. Oh yeah. The Academy of the Sacred Fool and all the workshops I do in the book, you know, it's supposed to be funny. It's like, this could all be bullshit. You know, let's just <laughs> all really, let's, let's not be so uptight around, I am on a spiritual path. I've been meditating for 12 years. But <laughs> still out. If you still need to tell me how many years you've been meditating, you probably need to start again from the beginning. Oh, God. Who cares? It's so relative. Yeah. Nobody cares how many so years look, you've been meditating. Ask me one more question because I've got to hit the road. Oh, no. Okay. Um, how how much time do we have? Like ten. We've got 15? another five ten minutes. Okay, so you end up making you you you're in the middle of this crisis, and I feel that I mean, and I, th I think you've pretty much said this that this personal crisis led to a much better film, and you released this double album, that is just huge. You know, I I I put it on. I used to write to that album all the time. I still do. It's such a rich, even bigger than the first one. And then you start working on... Did you start doing the workshops soon after that? Or how did the workshops Yeah, because it didn't begin? get released. The second one, Charlie, didn't end up getting released um, apart from in Australia. So suddenly it was... And there was a massive entertainment crash within the financial crash of the world. So it wasn't like you could still walk in places. And it, it was just... It was so much harder to get budgets to do things. Suddenly, they, all the labels were saying, we're not doing any new content. We're monetizing old content for the next three years while we work out what's going on in the world. Oh, no. So you just had to, all the artists had to just sit around from t 2010, 2013. If you weren't already massive, it was very, you couldn't get anything new funded. So, yeah, my girlfriend said, why don't you do something while you wait, you know, and, mm -hmm. and maybe get some people, you know, teach some people some stuff. And I was like, well, what could I possibly teach? And I thought, oh, well, one thing I could teach is how to bring your dream project into the world. I've done a lot of projects where I've had a wacky idea and they actually happened with a barcode and everyone loving them around the place. So mm -hmm. I could teach people how to actually get their thing done from idea to barcode. And I did that. And then suddenly just every single time I did it, I, we lived in Spain, 40 people flew in from different places to do it with me. And then I moved to the UK and I've been doing it for eight years now, three or four of those a month of different ones now, transforming shadows and insanely gifted switching on inspiration. Much more now about unediting ourselves back to unapologetic juiciness and joy and lightening up more than specifically project things these times. Mm. But um, yeah, that was that. And so now just a few albums along the way, I made the with Alex internal music for dissolving, which is a beautiful record. Um, and that's oh. on jamiecatto.com. I need to check and, that out. Uh, I have not got that yet. Oh, I think, You'll love that one. That's, that was a, uh, an album after the divorce to really contact those places of yearning in myself. Um, it's a really very quiet, emotional, s gentle record. And um, a lot of people do yoga and massage to it. Oh, that'll um, definitely go in the, the show notes. It's called sure. Music for Dissolving. Music for Dissolving. It, it rings a bell. Maybe I've heard you talk about and, it. Yeah, and then luckily the Ramdas people allowed me, when I said, please, can I make the definitive Ramdas film? They said, damn right, go for it. Here's all the archive. They were fully behind it. <laughs> that was my next question. Like, how did doing those workshops and lead you to speaking to Ramdas and making this? I mean, I, I've read reviews. No, I wasn't and... the workshops. I loved him for 10, 20 years before that. He was in both One Giant Leap movies. It was just a long way along the way. It wasn't really connected. It was just the creative things going alongside the workshop things. That's true. You had been d doing... You had, he had I been just always wanted to do the funny Ram Dass Greatest Hits movie. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Apparently, it shows a side of him that's much more uh, hilarious than you usually see. Yeah. He's, he's like such a sacred fool. How was that going? I mean, so he, I believe he lives on Maui. Like, how, how, how long did you shoot? Like, what was that process we just like? Went just went for a week just i managed to raise like a couple of grand to pay for the tickets and the camera guy mm -hmm. and uh, they gave me four two-hour interviews in a 10-day period and the rest of the time we were out meeting whales whenever we could and it's like i don't know if any of your listeners have met whales before but like if you're ever in maui or anywhere like that you know mm -hmm. whatever you do what you got to do to do you know but whenever you're free go and get in the ocean and even be near them and go underwater and hear them all talking to each other it's like Something about being around whales. I know it's a bit soppy in new age, but like whenever I've seen one, I've just immediately started weeping uncontrollably because oh. <laughs> it's almost like the tears of coming home. Like when you see one, yeah. you know you know something deeper is going on than just your own ego melodrama.
Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I actually haven't got to swim with whales yet. I've, I swam with an octopus. I, I'm, I'm here on the big island right now. Oh, wow. And we've, I, we've gone and we've done whale watching. Yeah. But haven't got to. You actually, did you get on one of those boats and go out? and? Yeah, we met a woman on Maui who was a sort of unlicensed whale watching woman. And she was like, I've lived here for 60 years. No one's going to tell me well, this, is, this is my <laughs> island. You know, right, so right. She, we met her at four in the morning and went off on her boat. And yeah, no, this is something about that. So yeah, no, the Maui trip was blissful. One, mm -hmm. hanging out around us, then going and hanging out with the whales. It was like an absolute peak moment of my life. Man, is there going to be any like behind the scenes um, footage of that available? Or is it There's already? some bits and bobs, yeah, on becomingnobody.com. If people sign up at becomingnobody.com, it does a few things. One, it tells you all the theaters where it's playing and the new ones coming out. Two, it offers you, if you want to host your own screening, oh. how to do that. And three, um, it opens up some of the clips where I only used them a few minutes. They, they show the longer lecture that it came from. Oh, definitely have to link that up. Cool, Matt. Well, I, well, I'll let you go in a minute. I, I do want to finish by asking because I, I love, I love your music so much, and I'm definitely going to check out the the other album you mentioned on your website. But do you think we're, do we think we'll ever get to see a, a third One Giant Leap album? We've just, funnily enough, Duncan and I, yeah. because of all the traumas that went on through the post production and what we had to go through to land and finish that film and stay sane, mm -hmm. um, we didn't work together for about a decade after that. Oh. Um, it, and um, it was just very hard being around each other because we vibrate. We we reminded each other of that incredibly difficult time. Both our dads died also during the the production. You know, it was like it was, it was intense. So we kind of represent that to each other. We needed a long break. But more recently, I, I wanted to start this film. Um, that and and what was weird was that I've lived in Oxford in England for eight years, and because I'm usually just there with my kids, I don't actually really know anyone around there. I'm only there by myself or with my kids most of the time. But it's where I live. Right. And weirdly, Duncan fell in love with someone and moved like four streets away from me. No. <laughs> so uh, he was like the first person who was around in 10 years in this place where I'd lived me and my kids. So uh, Sounds like was, kismet. Yeah, so we started doing some stuff and uh, it's sounding pretty good. So we've got the, the third one. Uh, we've kind of made a start, a little bit of a start on the I, The concept is Adam and Eve and healing the male and will, female mood on the planet. Ooh, I really like that. Because you, you, you write basically the melodies before you travel around right you do Mixture. a lot of some you do some you don't you get a, you know you, you get a little hodgepodge of stuff that you can use or not or develop or someone else comes up with something new it's just yeah it's very random very random well um yeah depending on how much time you have um I, we can we can wrap it up here but yeah that would be great but we can do another one another time i would love to talk to you again jamie i i want to say Please. again Thank you so much for taking some time this afternoon. You're you're in Colorado right now for the film tour. Yeah. And it's having sold out showings. If you are in a place that this film is going to be shown, please see it. It's getting really good reviews. And um, I'm going to see about, um, I know the the theater people here in town at the, the Hilo Palace. And I'm going to see if maybe we can get it in there. Cause yeah, great. That would be wonderful. I'll give you the email for that. Thanks a lot for yeah, having me. Definitely. Thank you so much, Jamie. And um, Sweet, yeah, I hope we can speak again. I'm really looking forward to yeah what's coming up next. And thank you so much for everything that you've created. It's it really gives us a, it gives us an opportunity to be more vulnerable, to explore our shadow sides. I think one of my favorite bits was um, you're talking about what the shadow side is, and the shadows is just the shadow is just the parts we hide away. It's not necessarily something that's bad either. Yeah. No. A lot of people have shut down their excitement and their childish glee and their flamboyant entertainer. And lots of parts of themselves have been made unwelcome, not just the yucky bits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just, I resonate with your message, man. I'm one of these days. If you come to Big Island, let me know. I'll show you some yeah, spots thank you. and maybe you can, uh, maybe you can sign my book. <laughs> Wicked, man. Thanks a lot again. <laughs> hey, thanks, Jamie. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a lovely day. Thanks. Aloha. Woo. What a great interview. Wow. What a guy. What a story. What a wow. I can't even imagine what they went through traveling dozens and dozens of countries, getting swept up in all these adventures, being able to record with Asha Bosley just randomly. <laughs> it really goes to show that when you're in alignment, when you're in the flow of life, beautiful things can happen. Before I leave you, I want to say a big thank you and mahalo once again to Jamie for sharing some of his afternoon with me. It was an honor and such a delight to hold space with him. 
Also, if you enjoyed this interview, there are more. iTunes is the easiest way to find them and get new ones when they come out. Just search for Aravinda Show. That's A-R-A-V-I-N-D-A. It's the Sanskrit word for lotus. And if you use Instagram, I'm Hello Crusoe on there. Uh, the word hello, C-R-U-S-O-E. I usually post samples of interviews when they come out. So it's a great way to know. Actually, pretty much always. And be sure to j- check out Jamie Cato at jamiecato.com. That's J-A-M-I-E-C-A-T-T-O.com. Learn more about Becoming Nobody, his incredible documentary that's catching on like wildfire, his book Insanely Gifted, his workshops, even free stuff like Music for Dissolving, which we talked about in this interview, that's free to stream off the website. And of course, all these links will be in the show notes for this episode over at Mythly. That's M-Y-T-H, the word myth, dot L-I. Go there, click on our Vinda show, and you'll be able to easily find show notes for this episode and all the great interviews, as well as free samples of my books, including my new Hawaii trilogy, 10,000 Hours in Paradise, a totally true story about my life-changing adventures on the big island of Hawaii. I'm Andrew Crusoe. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time.